when I begin to share any information of this sort, particularly if I'm working with a diverse audience, I find it's helpful to select a mindset. When we're moving into new information, when we're moving into maybe different models or kind of widening, stretching the mind and brain in some way, it can be helpful to select how we're going to engage with the information and really hold that in our minds and our hearts as we go into these kinds of discussions and particularly interdisciplinary discussions uh, and particularly if we have expertise in a field. Uh, really important to recognize and acknowledge how helpful it can be to have what I call this green container of intention, openness, and willingness to hear about something different. Uh, and this can help us, particularly if then the things that we are listening to might be provoking us or triggering us in some way. And this nomenclature of green and red, um, I'm glad to see Paul Gilbert will be speaking uh, in a forthcoming event. This, this comes from his work, actually. Green mode being the mode where we're relaxed and calm and open. This is really when we can learn, right? This is how we want our kids to learn, yeah? When they're in a playful, creative, safe, open mode. This is when their brains and minds can really develop. Uh, but recognizing that, you know, learning can also be a painful process, you know, particularly when we're being shown or offered things that are against the model that we already have. Uh, in our own mind. So for me, the setup here is how can we approach some of these more challenging questions about where brain and mind might meet uh, in a way that allows us to feel safe to explore what might be some risky territory or some challenging territory. So maybe just checking in with you now whether there's some words or, or phrases uh, that might be relevant for you. Um, as you come into this day. The three that I really like to work with are curiosity, courage, and compassion. The three C's. Having this as your mindset going into anything will, will, will serve you well. And the topic that we're talking about today is mindfulness. So I'm going to bring a little bit of context and background around the notion of secular mindfulness. Uh, this is distinct from the mindfulness that we might find within the contemplative traditions where there are some very clear guidance and pathways and structures for how to develop the mind, how to work with consciousness, uh, and how some of these traditions have kind of filtered through into our mainstream psychology and clinical services uh, in the form of various sorts of programs, maybe an eight-week program, something like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is being offered for depression, Maybe something like mindfulness-based stress reduction. Again, an eight-week program offered for chronic pain. And lots and lots of adaptations that are now going on uh, within the clinical world, within the education setting, within the criminal justice system. And this work is referred to as secular mindfulness because it's meant to be delivered in environments where we need to take care that it's accessible and open for everybody. So there is this distinction of secular and spiritual mindfulness, but let's also hold an awareness that if you are doing these practices that develop consciousness and develop your mind, it's possible that if you keep practicing, you, you begin to enter uh, experiences of consciousness that are no longer described well by the current Western scientific models. And in my work, certainly what's happened in the evolution uh, of my work as a scientist and a practitioner is really recognizing the value clinically, personally, for healthcare workers and for the whole system as a whole to be more interested in transpersonal psychology and what's referred to now as biopsychosocial spiritual models of health. But holding that lightly in mind, <laughs> um, <laughs> holding that lightly in mind, uh, the secular kind of position, which I, I try to sort of unpack a bit in, in this book, hashtag what is, what is mindfulness, is really to say, look, mindfulness and, and the elements of mindfulness have been around in our human story for, for many millennia in many different formats. And, and certainly contemplative traditions, specifically the Buddhist traditions, they've done a great job of, of kind of making the maps. But there's lots of other traditions where people have explored consciousness and mindfulness elements are woven within that. So we find that in the ancient Greeks, we find it in the creative traditions, we find it in shamanic traditions, we find it in all sorts of training, uh, whether it's body work, theater training, improvisation, you know, this notion of being present in the present moment, responsive, dynamic, 
flexing to the environment as it meets you uh, and kind. Sometimes kind is missing and I think that's what the, the mindfulness in its current format is really bringing to the fore. Um, but we see that there's a natural inclination of the human mind to, to want to be interested and present and grow and stretch and develop. But actually much of our modern world is pushing us more uh, towards states of distraction, reactivity, and really being judgmental uh, towards ourselves and towards one another. So for me, you know, there's lots and lots of definitions of mindfulness and the cognitive scientists are still arguing about the definitions, the Buddhist scholars are arguing, you know, there's a bit of a free for all going on there in terms of what people are saying is kind of allowed to be mindfulness or not. And, you know, for me, I think that, you know, these are academic debates, they're really important to have, but what does it mean for the man on the street that wants to, to know about mindfulness or the woman on the street who wants to engage? And for me, it's about increasing the probability of the amount of time in our life when we're present, responsive and kind, and trying to decrease the amount of time when we're distracted, reactive and judgmental. And it sort of sounds easy and obvious, but when we try to do it, we discover it's a little bit more tricky. And you know, often what people say when I start talking about mindfulness to them is they say, well, I'm kind of already doing that. I, I've kind of got this thing that I do and I feel really present and, you know, I had this great conversation with my auntie. She really helped me when I was writing the book. She gave me an amazing space in the countryside and fed me regularly and did all those wonderful things that, that aunties and, and family members can do for us when we're working hard and, and trying to share ourselves with the world. And she said, look, I'm in the garden all the time and I'm, I'm with the earth and I'm with the nature and I'm with the seasons and I'm seeing things unfolding. You know, isn't this mindfulness? You know, I'm, I'm kind of already doing it. Uh, and so we, we kind of looked at the model together and we said, well, yes, there's a number of features of what you're doing there that, that are akin to, to what we would describe as mindfulness. And from a neuroscience point of view, your brain is doing kind of some of the things. Uh, but then we kind of, you know, stayed interested in this question and, and she kind of went out into the garden and then she came back again and she said, oh, I think I've just realized what you're talking about, actually. It's more than just being present. Uh, because as I was out in the garden, I tripped over... Um, some, some bit of gardening equipment that had been left on the, on the floor. And she said, I noticed immediately this inner voice kind of saying like, oh, Anne, what are you doing? You're so stupid. Don't trip, o don't trip over things. You shouldn't have left that there. You shouldn't have left that there. And then I said, okay, right, that's it right there. It is about being present, but it's also then about noticing when we get into this internal inner critic dialogue you know, judging ourselves, being hard on ourselves, being overly critical, overly analytic. This is what pulls us away from the present moment. And it's not about not reflecting on our behavior, but there's this other added element of, can I relate to myself in a more gentle way? And that we know from the research, particularly with people with depression, um, it's that change in self-compassion that really underpins all the therapeutic benefits of a mindfulness training, certainly in the clinical work. And Paul Gilbert, I'm sure, will talk, you know, at, in depth around sort of some of the mechanisms about what's happening there when we, when we shift into these more compassionate modes of mind. And part of that shift that's needed, you know, to go from kind of being present to being in a mode where we're open and responsive and aware of how life has impacted us and aware of how our mental habits of judging and comparing and, and kind of maybe getting overly analytical. That's, that's my one. I come from a scientific training, so my analytic monkey is like really, really strong. Um, it, it requires us to begin to flex our attentional lens, to choose kind of how close we want to be with our attentional system to the experience that's going on. So uh, a recent trip uh, to uh, the jungle in Brazil inspired me through with nature here. And I, I really recommend to, to work with, with nature as a guide um, because there's lots of learning there. And this was something about, you know, do I choose to kind of just look at the surface level, you know, and then there's this stuff in the background that I don't really get clarity on because I'm sort of super immersed in, in what's happening here and now. You know, or can I deliberately learn to flex the aperture of my attentional lens uh, and make a choice to say, OK, well, there is stuff going on here, but actually I'm interested in, in what's going on a little bit lower down in the system. Or maybe I'm interested in playing in the space between. And this becomes more important because 
actually, as I mentioned before, our real world environment is highly distractive and technology is a key, key part of that. And I think m maybe those who kind of grew up without technology really know what that experience is like. The comparison perhaps of, of how we used to live when we weren't attached to our smartphones versus today. Digital natives are having a different kind of experience. Um, but I really suggest that we hold in mind what that was like, remembering what that was like. And digital detox is, of course, a, a huge market now for retreats and books and all sorts of things. And it's well worth, it's well worth taking a firm hand uh, on some of that distraction that we can manage with tech. We've got varying levels of reactivity. And of course, if you're working more in a clinical setting or a mental health setting, you know, these are are people who are reacting in a way that's becoming problematic. It's getting in, in the way of their day-to-day -day life. They need a little bit more help and skills and training, holding. Um, and then that judgmental aspect. I mean, we're constantly being invited to judge and compare. Constantly. The media has a huge part to play in that. So actually, the, the reality of the system that we live in is that it's, it's doing many things that are, is against our brain being mindfulness. So we do need to take a firm hand there and have some discipline. It's not just a case of saying, oh, well, let me just drop into the space between the thoughts in my mind. Well, you know, good luck with that if actually what you're doing is running from like one clinic to another and you've got 500 meetings and you need to fire three people. Like you need to be an advanced expert practitioner to do that. Um, you know, but what can we do to start kind of loosening up some of this stuff in order to optimize our mindfulness practice. And that's the kind of key thrust in the book, you know, how to prepare for mindfulness and actually really suggesting that you put the bulk of your thinking in what we refer to as the approach to the, the cushion, the intentions, the awareness. What is the kind of mind that you're bringing into the practice? How is your training, your development, your experiences, your conditioning, how is that going to impact on the practices you choose and do? And if we bring this more neuroscientific and cognitive framework to bear, Actually, there's a lot of information out there about how we can optimize. And this isn't about denigrating other traditions or other ways of doing it. It's about saying, look, if we take a neuroscientific and cognitive lens, we look at the reality of the world that we live in right now, how can we skillfully proceed? And, you know, we have these amazing brains. They're still largely unknown even to experts in the neuroscientific field. I mean, it's just such an amazing tool that we have and, and, and mostly abused and, <laughs> and misused, in fact. Um, but this is a, a beautiful image from the Wellcome Trust uh, image library of some of the fibers that connect the different parts of the brain together. And this is relevant for my work because I'm interested in network modeling, um, whole systems modeling of the brain rather than just what we used to call in the old days blobology, which is, you know, this blob does that and this blob does that. Well, actually, they're all connected. They're all connected and, you know, that's a feature of our brain. It's a feature of our world. Um, so let's be, let's be interested in that. Um, and my work particularly then has also been about saying, well, you know, part of what I believe is the issue in the current paradigm is the separation of, of mind and body and, and working clinically in my own experience and my own practice, the body is absolutely a fundamental part of the healing tool. And UK is a little bit slow off the mark with this. There's much more work going on in the States, also in Australia, about integrative ways of working within all of health, but particularly mental health. So I draw on neuroscientific principles, psychological theory, um, but much of my learning uh, and my own personal development has been through insights through training in the martial arts, Kung Fu and, and Tai Chi more recently. And as we go about this work, you know, we, we, we do still have some fundamental questions in the neurosciences that, that require grappling with, and it's coming, but it's slow. Uh, and this is really the question about, well, even if I go deep into the matter of body and mind, even if I really understand brain and cognitions and the models, you know, where is the I in this thing here? Where is that sense of self in the physical matter of the brain? And, you know, we're exploring this question and we don't really know. But we know that if we do want to get to it, we're going to have to plow through, you know, some quite a lot of conditioned habits 
the way our environment has conditioned our brains. Even now, my brain is conditioned to act in a certain way because I'm on a lecture theater and I've got a computer in front of me and all of that programming from my years of training and body cognition, how my brain codes information and helps me to act in certain ways in certain environments, that's all getting triggered now. Yeah, so this is habitual conditioning. Once we get below that layer, we get to our preferences. Okay, I've got some, I've got some DNA in my body. I've got some processes happening in my physical structure and my brain that mean I am kind of a certain way. Uh, I run on a little bit kind of side of rushy and hyper. That's, that's kind of the preference for my body. That's where I feel happiest, but it may not be the same for you. And then that place that we sort of aspire to reach, which is, okay, what is my choice? Yeah, have I trained my brain sufficiently to clear through habits, be very clear what's cultural, what I'm not interested in anymore, what's not serving me, becoming aware of my preferences. Okay, that's kind of my style. That's the way I love to do things. But actually, if I want to connect with others, I need to put some brakes on that and I need to make some choices about how to share my work, how to, how to communicate to people, how to get my intentions met um, whilst working with brain and mind together. So my intentions really for today is to share with you this, this four-stage model. And I use it clinically. I use it to design mindfulness programs. I use it to underpin uh, most of my thinking, actually, around this topic of, of mindfulness. And it lies at the heart of a group of embodiment, mindfulness embodiment tools um, that I've been developing over the last 10 years, maybe. Uh, and the idea is that these are really practical tools that will allow you to embody and embed mindfulness in your everyday life. So I'm really happy to share this with you and interested to hear in the Q&A maybe what it triggers for you about what you think in terms of how you might apply this in your own life or how this links with whatever practices you might be doing. Um, and we'll see that there's kind of four stages that are covered in a mindful moment. And when you're doing this with your brain and mind, you're activating three key networks that actually form the basis of what I believe it is to be mindful. And also, it's the same model I use when I'm trying to understand what's happening for somebody who's sitting in front of me in the clinic, distressed, upset, feeling overwhelmed, unable to cope, uh, using that model. What's referred to uh, in the neuroscience literature as the triple network model of psychopathology. I don't quite like that phrase myself. Psychopathology is not really a, a kind of kind word in my view but it is the view that's used uh, in the medical community. And some, some research and some people that are interested in these models are now saying that these three networks kind of, you can figure out where there's a disruption in, this, in, this, in these three networks. And that will give you a good clue as to the kind of symptoms that are sort of being, I kind of describe it as like farted out of the system, you know, depending where the blockage is. <laughs> in Chinese medicine, we'd say, depending on where the blockage is, you know, there's kind of these things that get spat out um, that are the symptoms. And it's the same three networks that we work and train in mindfulness. So when I looked at this work, it became very clear to me that it is possible that mindfulness based approaches can be helpful for pretty much anything. But you need to adapt and you need to know what you're doing and you need to be clear what your starting point is. Um, because I don't believe that one size fits all. So, a tiny other bit of rationale here, which is, you know, why am I so passionate about bringing mindfulness off the cushion into the real world? So, a big part of my work is this campaign, hashtag no cushion, hashtag mindfulness in, in motion. And part of the reason for that is because I work a lot with busy senior people. I work a lot in healthcare, doctors, nurses, people working in mental health care services, NHS. They don't have time usually to sit on a cushion for 25 minutes. That would be such a luxury and an amazing thing if they were able to do that. They don't usually even have 20 minutes to kind of take a shower or go to the toilet if they're working, for example, in a busy uh, ICU intensive care unit. And I use this slide to kind of frame this approach, which is to say, you know, back in the old days, we kind of just needed to know how to get from A to B. And the task was to find the brain and body that could do that the quickest. Um, you know, so hiring people was based on technical expertise, getting the job done, you know, the ability to implement a strategy and go from A to B as quickly as possible, like this Formula One car. 
Today's environment is very different. Yeah, we're not even sure where A is. We're not even sure where B is. We're definitely not sure where B is. There might be C, D, E, and F coming, which nobody can kind of tell us about. Literally, the whole landscape is shifting underneath our feet. Uh, and I, I sense that that's happening for people at the individual level as well as more systemically. Um, and it's certainly happening within British business and organizations. Uh, and so, you know, sad to say that this kind of vehicle is, is not really what we need anymore. Actually, it's not fit for purpose because what tends to happen in the brain particularly is when we meet a challenge, the brain normally says, well, I know, it's, I'll do what I'm always doing, but I just need to do it more. I do what I'm always doing, but I just need to put my foot on the gas more because clearly the reason that this isn't working is because I'm not trying hard enough. But imagine that you're doing that in this car, in this environment. And that's kind of where we're at at the moment. That's exactly where we're at. So there's a real need for people to say, look, I love Formula One. It's amazing. Wow, so fantastic. So sleek and amazing. And look at that, A to B, you know, 70 seconds or whatever. It's not, and it's not saying this is like a bad thing. It's just saying at the moment, it's not the vehicle that we need. So we need to check the vehicle. Yeah, and our mind and brain and body is the vehicle. And I believe that when the outside environment gets more and more chaotic, this is really the time to come inwards. And, you know, in many traditions, the way that we start a process of coming inwards is we go to study ourselves and we often start with the breath. So many, many traditions across cultures, across the world, might start with some form of breath practice. And we're going to do a mindfulness of the breath practice now. It's an invitation, so you don't have to do it if you don't want to. Uh, and we're just going to see what is it like to try to pay attention to the breath. I'm going to give you two options. If you're experienced at this, you can maybe go to breath in the nostril. If you're not experienced with this or you're maybe feeling a little bit more apprehensive or maybe have a breathing problem or some stuffed nose or something, I, I do suggest pop your hands uh, onto the body so you can get a really good sense of the breath moving through the body. And we'll just go for about three minutes. So before we start, set the intention. So in whatever way you would do this, I use kind of words in my head. I'm sort of saying, okay, Tamara, there's a lot of sensations going on around you, but I'd like this attention network in my brain to tune into any sensation relating to breath. So this could be breath at the nostril, the sensation of the air. This could be breath as it moves through the body. Sensations related to the rise and fall of the chest, the tummy. Or tuning in anywhere you can see or feel breath. Seeing how you've narrowed the focus of attention. Selected an object. How sounds or internal thinking patterns, imagery, how these pull the mind and take us away from just observing the breath. Am I doing it right is often a task related mind wandering that pulls us away from directly sensing breath, right or wrong, in or out, expand, contract. Just watch. So if you notice the mind has wandered, going, oh, Tamara, that's thinking about the sounds outside and worrying that sounds outside are distracting the audience. Okay, that's a thought, that's not breath. Let me get back to breath. The intention was breath. Focusing. Sensing, before naming, breath and body.
Mind wanders, very normal. Noticing that. And coming back. Seeing where you are in that four-stage process. Are you on the object, watching, observing? No meddling, no fixing, no changing. Am I lost in a mind wander, thinking about stuff? Am I in that moment of noticing, ooh, hang on a minute, that is not breath there. I've gone somewhere else with that. That's the moment to work on the inner voice. It's okay. It's okay. Wow, look at that busy monkey mind. No problem. And come back. Just one more minute of that. No need to control the breath. So mindfulness is not the same as yoga breathing. This is observing the breath just as it is. So as it is, it might be a short breath, a long breath. It might be a stuffy nose. It might be all sorts of things. Allow it to be. There's a sense that this is uncomfortable. You can introduce a bit of counting, but you've added something there to be clear. I'm finishing with three breaths. Opening the eyes. So does anybody want to give a little bit of feedback about that? Yes, hi, just maybe shout your name as well. Uh, my name is Michael Lowton. Hi Michael, welcome. Michael um, I had an experience of um, uh, feeling the breath, observing the breath, and in a way almost being and becoming the breath. Mm-hmm. Great. How was that? <laughs> Where were you in this model, do you think? Focus Yeah. So no mind wandering whatsoever. You got quite, you became very absorbed in here. Great, yeah. Okay, how about others? Yes. Hi, my name is Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, I've recently started uh, meditation on that for the past month. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if I was to reflect back on that month, mm -hmm. I'd have so many negative automatic thoughts go through my mind. Yeah, where would that be on here? Now, yeah. I'm more on, I'm, I'm tending for to focus on breath. Yeah. But I'm on the outside thinking as the observer. Oh, over here. Yeah. What's going on. Yeah. You that. Yeah, great. And I guess to be clear, there are two types of attention practices, focused attention, open monitoring. So those that are familiar with, with, with maybe more Buddhist traditions, also creative practices, um, you know, we have this option to be doing a more formal focused attention training or to do a more open monitoring. Uh, and a lot of my work is really on doing some of that more foundational focused attentional training. And, and the rationale for that really is when we're dealing particularly with, you know, strong emotions in the body, uh, difficulties, challenges that are highly arousing creating a system that, that's kind of high in arousal, threat mode is on, actually you need a bit of attentional welly for that because those emotional states and those mind states do tend to hijack the attentional system and it's fantastic if you can kind of sit and observe and watch it all. But my experience is that people who have high levels of distress and low levels of attentional training get pulled into that quite quickly and get lost quite quickly. So much of my work is about using grounding practices and also movement to really help hold the, the focused attention, but an awareness that that can then become open monitoring practices. Uh, yes, gentleman at the back. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, hi, my name's Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Um, I wonder what the purpose was for focusing on the breath. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, as opposed to the gap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, when we're working in the clinical setting, we do make an assumption that people are coming in naive to these practices. And I'm aware that this audience probably is not naive to these practices. 
Uh, the breath is a, is, a, is a tool to use for so many reasons. I mean, the main one in the spiritual traditions is that it does provide a bridge between conscious and non-conscious processing. So we can mostly, we're breathing on automatic pilot and that's right that we should do so, but we have the capacity to bring this automatic process into our conscious awareness. So already we're then training the neural architecture that we need to kind of switch between levels of awareness, like in that picture of the leaves, yeah? Secondly, the breath is highly linked to our emotional state. So if we begin to study and, and, and engage with the breath in this way, we will be gathering data and information about the physiological arousal of our system, how we get agitated, how agitation affects the breath, how the breath is when we're calm and relaxed. So it has kind of multiple functions. But for me, one of the main reasons about working for the breath is the breath is a moving target. And a moving target is much easier for the untrained mind to pay attention to. Yeah, uh, same as with movement. It's much easier for me to notice that my mind has wandered if I'm trying to pay attention and follow the movement of my arm. And then I realize that I've been thinking about shopping for like this much and I've missed all of that sensation. My body has told me that I've missed something and that my mind has moved away. Same with the breath. You know, we think that we're on the breath and then we see the mind splitting. And then we're kind of like, I'm kind of on the breath. Don't worry, it's all good. I still got the breath there. Oh, but I'm like, who's that coming in the back of the room? I hope those guys are not drilling out there. Oh my God, the bloody drilling. Ah. Yeah, so I can see that my mind then splits because my brain is going, you don't need to pay attention to this. You know how to do this. So that's when I'm training. That's right there is when I'm training, when my brain is trying to put it back into automatic. And I'm saying, I see you going there. Oh, no, come back out. Uh, what was your experience just now, though? I mean, trying to kind of hold on to what people are in right now experiencing. Um, I was very aware of my thoughts wandering. Mm. Um, the practice, um, <coughs> trying to keep it focused on the breath, which is something that I don't Suspended in the, in the middle of the breath, yeah? Suspension of the breath, yeah, that's a very classical technique. Again, I, I certainly, again, I think I really need to contextualize this. Imagine that you're delivering this inside a GP office, yeah? Imagine that you're delivering this inside a GP office and, you know, space between the thoughts, suspension of the breath, you know, this is, is, is sounding a little bit kind of yoga spirituality, so, you know, it's fine that that can be there, but lots of my work is about kind of making that bridge into mainstream healthcare. So I do come with the more kind of concrete basic of the practices. Um, but it's interesting because I think more and more people are approaching spiritual practices. And part of my work is about how do we skill the healthcare force to be more open to allowing these conversations and not freaking out. If somebody does want to come and say, well, I do this practice. You know, then the healthcare worker's job, particularly if it's somebody with a long-term condition, is to say, how can I help you do the thing that you find helpful more? Even if I don't agree with it, even if I'm a bit freaked out by it, you're telling me that that's helpful for you. I want you to do that as much as possible. What do you need? Yeah, so it's a, a different kind of shift. Anybody else? Yeah, hi, down at the front. Yes, uh, I'm Roy Maunder. I'm um, noticing when I'm focusing on breath, it makes me more sensitive to all the other senses. Yes, great. Yeah. Somebody else had that? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, perfect, perfect, yeah. So when we use the mindfulness lens, we're amplifying attention, yeah? We're choosing to deliberately take hold of our attention. It's mostly not under our control. This is what people find even when they start doing a basic mindfulness of the breath, how difficult it can be. Working with medical professionals, actually, it's quite sort of mildly amusing, but more for me than them. Um, because they expect that they can do things brilliantly. Yeah, they're really bright people. They've been working hard. They've got really great skills. They're the you know, cream of the crop. They were selected from A-levels. You, you can do medicine, you can do medicine. You know, they've got a strong competency uh, identity. And they try and do a mindfulness of the breath and they can't do it. And they freak out. Yeah, they can freak out. And connecting to the body and the emotions and breaths is also something quite scary for many healthcare professionals who are quite dissociated, disembodied and traumatized. Yeah, so that's why we need to kind of take care because we're not coming from a baseline of like normal. <laughs> yeah, calm, relaxed, okay, open, feeling free and interested. We're coming from a position of traumatized, dissociated, 
hopeless, you know, feeling powerless, and yet with a huge responsibility and demand. That's modern healthcare, sadly, currently. I'm going to keep going, but there's, but there's room for other questions and comments at the end. So, you know, actually, you can work with breath, but you've got options. You can stick anything in here, really. Uh, and how I work is mostly with mindful movement because I believe it's got some really amazing properties that allow us to do this work much more efficiently. But you can do breath in the body and the nostril. You can do soles of the feet, walking, standing. You can do listening, which we're going to talk about in a second. You can do shoulder rolls. You could do mindful viewing of some beautiful artwork and, and kind of I've done some work like this with the National Gallery, sort of mindful viewing, really staying present with the image, noticing what gets triggered in the mind, sort of being a bit more playful in that creative space space there um, but then coming back and just staying with staying with a piece of artwork staying with something in nature and and just not looking at it too quickly and running away but being interested like when I put my attention on this thing what proliferates around that and sometimes the proliferation is stuff that we need to manage the mental hygiene of the mental monkeys that we don't really think service anymore but sometimes it's that beautiful wonderful stuff of of the creative process and and the insights that we can get from engaging with the world in this mindful way. So this is the book um, that's more about movement practices. Um, not so much focusing on that today, but if you're interested in that, um, you can find that on my website or on Amazon. And this is just a little example of how we use this creatively. Uh, this was a project working with mums with postnatal depression. So you imagine uh, a mum with a new baby and postnatal depression, if you start talking to her and saying, well, what I need you to do is a 45 minute body scan where you lie down and you're in a nice quiet environment and uh, you just listen to the audio and you do 45 minutes body scan. They're just gonna walk out the room. Uh, if you even just say, find 45 minutes to just do anything that you love for yourself, Probably they would still struggle, but you know that is the starting point. Um, so what we did was we integrated the model with uh, creativity. So we were looked at combining mindful design of a creative intervention for postnatal depression, and we picked sewing, and we worked with some Japanese technique called sashiko, which is really amazing for training and taming the mind. You can see here uh, every stitch is an opportunity to get that attention network um, really kind of zoomed in, and there's a lot of tactile sensations and color and and things to hold the mind. Of course, the minute you start performing in this way, whether it's sewing or movement, the judging monkeys come, the comparison monkeys come, sometimes we kind of drift out, uh, out of the mind, we're sort of zoning out, or we might have some kind of creative mind wandering and insights. And if you're in a full mindfulness training mode, you know, hardcore attention training mode, then you need to sort of say, wow, look at all that stuff my mind is doing. No thanks, actually what I'm doing is sewing. Get, just get back to sewing. Oh no, hold on a minute, my mind is now doing blah, 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 blah. No, that's not sewing, just get back to sewing. Same process as what we did with the breath, same neural networks activated. Uh, it's a little bit more fun, there's a little bit more pull for the attention because you're doing something. Um, and actually, this, this work can do the same thing as a, as a normal training. You get to see how much the mind judge and, judges and compares. And it's doing this all the time. And it's really doing it when you've got postnatal depression and it's about serious stuff like you're not a good mum and you can't care for your baby and you're doing it all wrong and you're gonna harm your child and look at all the other mums standing at the school gates and how they're doing it all right and why isn't my husband like that? <laughs> um, you know, so it's all in there. Now what we're judging and comparing, the content of it is our own unique stuff. Yeah, and it is helpful to do a bit of your psychology work just to know your triggers and know what's your What's your gunk that's going to come out? But the process of judging and comparing is common to us all. It's just what we judge and compare about is, is distinct. So working with these mums, you know, we had a session which was about get it wrong. So we basically gave them the fabrics and we said, right, we want you to, um, today's session, we're going to just basically sew as badly as we can. Uh, I want you to kind of take the fabrics. I want you to, you know, screw it up as much as you can. I want you to get it really, really wrong. Uh, every time you put the needle in and it looks like it's going to be a good stitch, uh, I want you to take the needle out again, make it like wonky or like sew it together, um, you know, just make it wrong. And it was actually such a hard task. It was so interesting. Any perfectionist out there, I really suggest that you have a go at this. Um, and what happened was even the material that they produced, when we kind of put it on the table and we were kind of just discussing it, 
they were judging that their wrong wasn't wrong enough. <laughs> and I'm glad you're laughing because this is the correct response to the mind. This is the correct response to that, that mind. And that's all our minds, really, a version of that. Um, they have it just to the nth degree, these mums. You know, look at her wrong. Her wrong is better than mine. <laughs> she got her wrong more wrong than my wrong was. So, you know, you can see that when we're working in this way, we can still do it with a kind of strong scientific model and underpinning. We're bringing the neuroscience. We're bringing the, the, cr the creativity. We're bringing the cognitive models. We, we know a little bit about the cognition of you know, postnatal depression or kind of what that, what that part of mind and brain is like in OCD and psychosis and depersonalization. So we can use that information to help design, you know, what is, what is the best way to help people? And can we use this model and the creative means to, to really draw out some different kinds of discussions and dialogue? And some examples of the work here, which I think you'll agree, I mean, I hope you agree, because it's so beautiful. Look, the space between space between this mum picked this we had some beautiful fabrics which does help i have to say but you don't need to get fancy with it but um she sewed in between the space i mean any psychotherapist in the room have a field day with that probably but um you know it, it's just beautiful work and then here you know the mums were saying look i just i needed that bit of structure to just kind of hold me together but then i was able to create my own piece on top of that Again, sort of a beautiful metaphor for seeking help, finding help. I need just a little bit of holding around the structure so that I can then explore. And for me, that's what I use the neurocognitive model for. It's, you know, it's not like full fact. It's a model, but it's a model that provides a structure that can help you to grow and develop and then find your own way. And then this was another mum, a lady who was actually really struggling. And it was... Her, her therapy in that group was that she got there every week and that was enough. And again, in our healthcare services, that's often not enough because you have to get to there and you have to do the questionnaire and then you have to do session six of the 12 sessions and blah, blah, blah. But actually in this mindful way of working, you basically need to show up and be with the group and whatever else you can step into um, is great. So if you happen to be um, near to Guy's Hospital, um, what, what we did at the end of the program, we made a big quilt uh, and we put all the work in together, the great stuff, the bad stuff, the mistakes and the stuff that we were really proud of, the whole team as well as the people that were in the group, the students that were involved, everybody put something into a big quilt um, and uh, it's up on the wall uh, at, the, at the atrium one. It's going to be there probably till the end of the year then. I'm looking for a new home for it. So if anybody has a wonderful space where you want to have this exhibition, which basically shows the quilt which was the product, the output of all the, the mum's training in the neurocognitive model. And then this is kind of the story of how we did the intervention. Here's the even my wrongs not right um, piece of artwork that was selected by the group to show. So this is teaching medical students. We use the creativity. We use the model to work with pedagogy within medicine as well. And uh, they were doing what you did, mindfulness of the breath and looking at the works and, and kind of being inspired by women that, you know, really are are up for it and they're working hard to to take care of their minds so that they can take care of their kids and you know that's that's kind of the metaphor for all of us as well especially in health how do we take care of ourselves to make us resourced for those that we're taking care of um, and self-care and self-compassion it turns out is good for the staff as well so that's helpful we can all do that well, we'll come to that <laughs> because emotions are certainly part of life. And, you know, maybe people in this room have had that experience of being overwhelmed by emotions. Yeah. When the body and the mind go into this kind of completely absorptive takeover, you had the experience is Chris. Is it Chris? Right. You had David. Sorry. You had the um, Kevin. Kevin. Sorry. You had the experience of being kind of quite absorbed in the breath in that practice, which is amazing. You know, wow, wonderful. Like, what a maybe beautiful, peaceful place to rest the mind. But imagine you have that level of absorption in an experience of psychotic voices and kind of trauma-related bodily sensations. You know, this is a tough, tough place to be. And you need some attentional muscle, um, you know, to help you get out of that. And so working, going round and through the model uh, is my way. Um, to help people to really kind of train that muscle uh, and really be sure I know how to switch from attending to being lost, noticing, getting back, attending, getting lost, noticing, getting back. And, you know, 
one type of practice is I go in, I become very absorbed, and I'm kind of there and I'm still. Fantastic. If you've got some kind of emotional things that you're working through, that's respite. That's not working through your stuff. That's an exercise to kind of help you rest and be calm. But I really would then be recommending you need to be in this mindful process and moving around. Otherwise, you don't see the landscape of mind. And you won't see the landscape of mind, which means you won't discover the conditioning from habits, the conditioning from preferences, and the places where you can make choices. So just as you go into the break, um, I want you to, to kind of get a sense of, of, of the application of this. And one of the applications is, is mindful listening. So this is a fundamental thing that I teach all over to my students, to my clinical clients in workshops, in corporate, in boardrooms, deep listening. Again, huge amounts of work on this topic, loads and loads of people doing it really, really brilliantly. Uh, for me, I just thought, OK, how does this work with what my brain is doing? I need to set the intention to listen. Very important. If you don't set the intention deliberately, then you've already kind of wasted half of what you're doing, in my view. So that moment where you say, I'm just going to listen. When I go into the lunch break today and I meet someone, I'm going to set the intention to just listen. Full attention. And naturally, as you're listening, there's a sensory information entering into your brain. Sounds, which meets your mind, which meets your memories, which meets your impressions and associations. And you start to then form kind of meaning and action on the basis of what the person's saying. And very often, very often, even now, maybe while I'm talking to you, you're having that experience of the mind is reacting to what I'm saying, resonating with what I'm saying, planning questions or planning what you're going to say to somebody else about what you heard in the talk. Remembering. So we talk about having associations triggered. This is when something coming into the brain has kind of tapped on your hippocampus and your brain is kind of going, I sort of know something about this. Let me just bring that up for you. Uh, and you can compare it to what's going on now with the thing that you know. Yeah, it's a fundamental property of the brain. It compares. Do I know it or not? Is it new or not? What do I know about it or not? This is why it's hard for experts to be curious. Yeah, because the information comes in and their brain just brings a whole massive load of stuff up. Wow, I know a lot about this. So they have to work extra hard to be curious. But this is a practice that can help you do that because fundamentally you're listening. Then you notice that your mind is doing that. Then you say to yourself, Tamara, that's you reacting, responding, resonating, planning, blah, 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 blah. Or maybe I just drifted off because the person's really boring. Who knows? Um, but, you know, that's not listening. Is it important for me to listen? Come back. And I'm half joking about the drifting off because you may notice that there are some people that you're talking to that you're not interested in what they're saying. And it's very helpful to be aware of that because sometimes what happens when people do these developments, training in consciousness, training in self-awareness, is that they do find that they start to cull some of their friendships. Yeah, I don't know if people have had this experience, but... You know, when you begin to really value your energy and time, including the brain energy that you're using to pay attention, to be really present with someone, why are you making that effort? Are you in a relationship that's reciprocal around this? Wounded healers, specifically I'm talking to you, <laughs> because it's probable that in your social life, when you're meant to be resting and restoring and taking care of yourself, I imagine that you probably have lots of friends that, that really lean on you and, and kind of drain you potentially. And it's okay as long as you're choosing that. But what I began to notice with some of those relationships, not all of them, was that it was really effortful to listen. And when my mind wandered, it was like extra effortful for me to get back. And I just got curious about that. Why is that? I think I'm a good listener. I think I'm a nice person. I'm a mindfulness therapist. So, you know, I need to help everybody that's got problems you know, wow, what are these beliefs and assumptions and are they serving me? Yes? Yeah, I believe some people just don't want to be helped or they don't know, so they just yeah. want to be listened to. Yes. But then you tell them, oh, have you tried this and this and they're just ignoring it. Yeah, so save your breath, basically, and just go deep listening. <laughs> deep listening. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that's not, that was fake listening, actually. That was fake listening. So watch out for that, too, I suggest. Mm, yes, yes. I think I've got a thing of this, yeah. So, you know, as always, Peanuts classics. Uh, 
You know, so what do you think? What difference does it make? You never listen anyways. I was just making conversation. When you make conversation, you have to listen too. You do? <laughs> so it's something about the reciprocity. I think that's my main tip, you know, and just really begin to notice, like, if your mind and brain is sort of drifting in and out of a conversation, you know, maybe now's not the time to have it. Maybe you're tired. Maybe that's why it's effortful. And my language has really changed here with people because I do say things now like, okay, well, I can talk to you now, but I'm walking down the street, so you've got 60% attention. Is that sufficient for what you need? <laughs> yeah? Or if it's something really serious, I say, look, what you're saying is really important to me. And I would like to give it 100% of my full attention when I'm not in an environment where there's buses going by. I know that my brain can't focus here for you. And this is an important conversation. In fact, it's so important. I don't want to have it on the phone. We need to be face to face. That is skillful, skillful use of your mind and brain. If it's a quick thing and doesn't need much thinking, OK, I can deal with it while I'm walking down Oxford Street and talking to you at the same time. So it's about them being really efficient with our energy, with our brains, with our minds. Um, and being able to communicate in a new language with people. And that's certainly something that's coming out um, in, in the work now, which is how do we deepen our shared understanding, the language that we use to talk about brain modes, to talk about how the brain is for us, preferences, what we call cognitive diversity uh, in the workplace. Uh, and also, like, why are we doing the things that we do? Yeah, why am I listening to this person, you know, Am I really interested? Are they really interested? Are we just playing some game where they come and they dump all their stuff on me and then I sit there and then I feel rubbish at the end and I don't get anything out of it? Now, sometimes those are people that we do need to keep listening to and need to stay engaged with, but I really recommend that it's okay to take care of yourself in that moment. And there might be some friendships or some scenarios where you just say, this doesn't serve me well. And in fact, maybe it's feeding some of the more negative habits you know, that, that get me stuck. So we'll pause there. Uh, we've got a five minute break. Taking a moment to pause, transition mindfully. And let's do a little transitional pause coming back in. Again, brain wise ways of, of learning, of, of opening the mind is acting with awareness, acting with intention, choosing and selecting what your brain is doing in any given moment. So. Breathing in, breathing out, and acknowledging just the morning thus far, the information, the break, the conversations, going to the loo. How has that left its footprint on the mind and the body right now? Tuning into that as best you can. What do I bring with me into now? This is a more kind of open monitoring practice of seeing how activities, conversations, tasks, and movements leave their mark on the physical body and the mind space, data gathering. Breathing in, breathing out. What's really here now? Bottom on the chair, feet on the floor, coming into those very concrete sensations of hands, feet, body connected to the chair, posture. And then breathing in, breathing out, revisiting your intentions that you perhaps arrived with and seeing if that's still live for you, if that's still relevant for you and adjusting if you need to. Maybe the intention to do mindful listening. Really trusting that your brain can gather and hold the relevant information that you need to hear if you bring this mindful listening process to the talk. And finishing with three breaths. Opening the eyes.
So we're kind of promised something that looks a little bit like this often when we people start talking about meditation and mindfulness. And to be clear, those are two distinct words in my view. Again, lots of people kind of arguing about this, but for me, mindfulness is one of a large category of meditation practices um, that can include a whole variety of things that brain and, and heart and mind are doing. Um, but it is for me a foundational practice because it has at its core a need to tame and train the attentional network. Um, and this will facilitate any other practice that you're doing. Yeah, so I kind of have this tagline, sort of like mindfulness makes everything better, um, but you're not necessarily guaranteed like these blissed out clear states. Actually, the way that mindfulness makes things better is often that we just do a big load of kind of trekking through the landscape of, of the mud of the mind. Uh, and we do kind of a lot of clearing out is, is really stage one of a mindfulness practice. Um, but attention training is a fundamental piece of it. Attention alone is not mindfulness. It's this quality of the attention, which is gentle, interested, kindly. Um, but it has a firmness. Yeah, we are using our brain. We are engaging our brains. We need to make an effort and concentrate and do something. We've said that we were going to be on the breath. And if we're not on the breath, what are we going to do about it? Yeah, there is a success and fail of being on the breath. Um, and yet we might have a, a bigger intention that, that kind of helps us like, okay, my mind wants to get really, really busy thinking about all the emails that I have to send and, and breath is boring. And then it's at that moment I remember, okay, but, but you, you want to use mindfulness to help you transform your mind and live well and better in a less reactive way with less cortisol in your brain and better memory and better relationships and all of those things. So drop that. Drop that thinking that your brain is telling you is so compelling. It's not. Get back to the breath. Uh, and so when we do this, um, we're engaging three different networks of our brain. And I'm, I'm really inspired by Wendy Hassenkamp's work. Uh, she's one of these, she's the science director, I think, of the Mind and Life uh, Institute, which is an institute that looks at dialogue between contemplative practitioners and scientists. Um, they're a bit Buddhist heavy, in my personal opinion. Um, but they're doing great work. And so she did a neuroimaging study with experienced lay practitioners. These are people that are experienced working with breath practices. They were predominantly coming from Buddhist traditions, which, which is important to be aware of. And she asked them to be in the MRI scanner while it was collecting real-time data on the oxygenation of the blood uh, in the brain, which is our indirect marker of neuronal activity. Um, and she asked them to click a button when they noticed that their mind had wandered. Um, and again, you know, we could do a sort of a mini experiment of that now, just even 30 seconds, you know, pay attention to the breath and just tap your finger uh, on the desk or on your leg, you know, when you notice that the mind has wandered. Yeah, you know, we're kind of on the breath. I mean, mind's gone immediately two seconds, like, oh God, are they doing it? Can they do it? Are they understanding what I'm asking? You know, it's a really kind of a fun experiment, you know, and it, and it may be that, you know, you're excellent trained and your attention is great and you're fully absorbed and your mind doesn't wander. But, you know, actually, if we're, monitoring the flow of sensory information coming into the brain from the body as we breathe. You know, you need to be kind of staying with that present moment and the changing of the sensations and mind will get pulled every now and again. And we want to get quicker and quicker at, at, at being aware of that. And I think somebody mentioned that, you know, when we start off, actually, we don't even realize that we're not present. We're just living in this world of kind of mind wandering and reactivity. We're sort of looping over on the right hand side of the model. And then somebody says, oh, well, why don't you pay attention to the breath? And you kind of say, oh, right, OK, I can do that. I can put my attention there. And, and suddenly, the attempt to be mindful illuminates a whole bunch of mindlessness. Uh, we meet our mind. Uh, and so then we have that option to kind of say, OK, well, hang on a minute. Let me just come back. Let me just come back. And we get quicker and quicker at looping back. We get quicker and quicker at looping back. Uh, but we're still wandering a little bit at times. And I like the work of Alan Wallace here. He's got a great book called The Attention Revolution, where he details the nine steps of what's called the shamatha training from the Buddhist tradition. Um, and I think somewhere it says like shamatha stage six, which is basically you are a monk and you are dedicating your life to training attention in this way, living in the mountains, in environments where there's no other distractions and somebody is feeding you regularly. You know, this level of practice is, is, is not really attainable by people that are living in the real world. Um, they might be able to have unwavering, clear, focused attention, maybe on three breaths. Maybe on three breaths. 
So that's the reality of, of kind of what we're talking about in terms of like, what are we really doing and what is the mind really doing? Even sometimes when we think that we're really kind of in the breath, there are lots of tricks of the mind um, that, that mean that we are actually, we're kind of present, but we've also a little bit stepped out of being fully present. So Wendy's work for me was, was really important. It, it kind of started a whole chain of thinking and actually this is the neuroscience paper that underpins um, the work that I describe in the book and kind of all the work that I'm doing now. So huge gratitude and you can find her on, uh, I think she's on um, Twitter as at NeuroWendy. So, you know, drop her a line and say hi, she's really great. Um, and, you know, when she was doing this work, she basically pulled out that the three networks involved in this uh, are, of course, the attention network, which is what we use to pay attention to things. Uh, something called the default mode network, which is the network that's activated when our attention on an object dims and we become absorbed more in our internal world, whether that's thinking, memories, associations, whether that's deliberate or triggered automatically by something. And then the moment when our brain says, hello, Tamara, you said you were going to be on the breath and now you're thinking about what you're having for lunch or that your tummy's rumbling or you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there's a conflict. Yeah, you said you were on breath, but now what I'm aware of, the sensations that this attention system is processing, they're not from the breath. So I'm just checking in. I'm just checking in with you tomorrow. Is that what you wanted? Uh, and that's called the salience network. And it's primed by our intentions, which is why intention setting is really, really important uh, because the intention setting primes our brain to be on the lookout for breath sensations and just go, oh yeah, we're on the breath. Great, 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 great. Breath, 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 breath. Then suddenly there's an awareness of like thinking about emails and the system goes, uh -uh, this is not breath. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to get back to the breath, the task that you said you were doing, or do you want to think about emails? And you know, literally we are going around this loop over and over again. And when we do so, what we're doing is we're switching between the brain networks and we can use many, many different objects. Uh, the suggestion is to use movement if you're in a system that's particularly busy internally or externally. Uh, we've talked about using it in the applied way, which is the mindful listening. You can use walking static practices to go in there. You can use breath. You can use mantra. You can put a prayer in there if you want to. So you're praying to God. You're doing your prayers. Suddenly you start thinking about shopping. Uh, you're not really praying anymore. You notice, oh, I'm supposed to be saying my prayers. I'm not saying my prayers. Let me get back to saying my prayers. And many people that say prayers on a regular basis, they do get very automatic with it, very rote. And, you know, the secular mindfulness is interesting because we can be secular, but we can accommodate others. Yeah, so I often say this model kind of, it is a secular brain-based model, but it doesn't have a lid. If you want to go into transpersonal spiritual practices, you can. Um, but you're fundamentally, you're doing the same thing. And, and working with a lot of medical students, they come from very diverse cultural backgrounds. Um, and, uh, you know, we've had a number of students from the Islamic faith in our training that we've been running at King's. And, you know, they, they wrote some amazing, amazing essays, actually, which I'm trying to get permission to, to share some of them. But it was, it was coursework, um, basically called Muslim and Mindful. And they talked about how the mindfulness practice and particularly the mindful movement had helped them to reconnect to core elements of their spiritual practice, including really re-embodying while they were doing particularly the movements of the body during prayer, because they were saying it just was totally automatic. I just go to the prayer mat and I do it and I'm kind of doing it and it's all automatic. I lost the intention. Yeah, the intention about what, why am I doing this? What's the bigger picture? What, you know? So there was a freshness that came back into their prayers as a result of, of seeing this. Um, so, so for me, I think that's important. Um, but fundamentally, it's about switching. Uh, it's about being able to rapidly switch between different networks and different modes of attention and different types of awareness. And we get to that through practice. Uh, we, maybe some people have a unique ability to do certain aspects of it, but definitely we can all practice and, and a function of the brain is neuroplasticity uh, and particularly within the attention network. So the attention network is broadly comprised of two, two sort of nodes. We, we call it the frontal parietal network. So here's the frontal lobe, the kind of fancy pants thinking, organizing the executive attention holding in your working memory the idea like I was going to be on the breath. There's something that needs to just be kind of holding that as a goal or an intention uh, while you then also recruit other parts of the attention network to help you sustain, focus, maintain, see clearly, not waver. Uh, and a lot of that's going on in the frontal lobe. 
Uh, the parietal lobe of the attentional system is of more interest to me because this is about spatial movement. Uh, and so there's some recent research coming out suggesting, um, as many meditators would probably already know, and as some of my work also was pointing to, that thoughts are a type of movements trapped in the brain and the mind. So seeing thoughts as a kind of movement um, is, is a shift that's coming in the neuroscientific community. Um, and for me, I believe that when we start to dig into this a little bit deeper, we're going to find that actually it is important to include you know, a sort of often neglected area of the attention network, which is the spatial attention network. Mostly people think it's more about, you know, where is my body in space? Where am I in relation to other people? Um, but those are also fundamental kind of spatial relationships, aren't they? Where am I in relation to other people? Where is my body? Where is your body? Where do those things meet? Where, where do they not meet? Um, and so both of these are likely to be important. But the majority of the work has really focused on how we can train, improve, and increase the efficiency of these frontal lobe networks for attention. And this has a huge value in our school system, in our workforce. Uh, if you're a therapist or a carer, you know, attention is your most valuable commodity. You can't pay, really, for this high quality, deep, and caring, compassionate attention. If somebody gives that to you, it's an amazing gift. It's an amazing gift not to be squandered. And yet, you know, much of our modern society is about degrading that. Um, and a lot of the mindfulness work is about reclaiming, reclaiming attention. So one of the things that, that pulls our attention is the tech, the external environment. But the other thing that pulls us is our internal landscape. And that's shown here with the nodes of what's called the default mode network. So the default mode network includes the hippocampus, which is our memory regions. Uh, it, it also has a sort of frontal parietal um, aspect to it, but now we're kind of right inside the midline of the brain. We also have this distinction here with this attempts of the brain and the mind to make sense of what's my stuff and what's other people's stuff. So these regions of the medial prefrontal cortex, this means kind of right inside the midline of the brain, where we try to work out what other people are thinking, how that relates to us, how does that relate to our story. Um, we're kind of working out what would it be like in that person's shoes, what, what experience do I have of this. We're basically creating kind of simulated environments in our mind to help us make sense of the world, ourselves and others. Uh, and then this more parietal region as well, where there's some suggestion that, that here it's connected to networks which are about helping us to understand self versus other. And anyone coming from more Buddhist or spiritual traditions will be kind of triggered by that, that sort of language. You know, where in the brain are we distinct from one another and where in the brain actually does the brain not make any distinction between self and other? Or actually there's a, a function within those processes where we tease it apart. Uh, many of the contemplative traditions are about getting back to a point where there is no separation around that. So neuroscience and the contemplative traditions are, are sort of meeting and dialoguing about this, uh, and it's an ongoing piece of work. If you're working with strongly conditioned mental habits that are represented by grooves of neurons firing together, wiring together in highly automatic ways at a deep, deep level, triggered rapidly, mostly outside of awareness. And you know, these are the habits that people might bring into the clinical setting, and these are the habits people bring into work, you know, even if they're not in distress. We're highly, highly conditioned by our early environments. Uh, and they impact on what we pay attention to, they impact on how we use our default mode network space, and they're definitely related to how our salience network is tuned. Um, so having some of this psychological understanding from a neurocognitive model is really, really helpful when you go into your practice. It's about making it quicker. It's about making it more efficient. And I realize that there are spiritual practices, contemplative traditions, where going quicker is, you know, the antithesis of what they're all about. But my approach is really about saying we do need to do something more quickly now. We're in a major crisis, mental health crisis. And, you know... Maybe it's kind of wrong to, to try and speed these things up. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to, to kind of take some risks and have a go at how we can speed things up uh, in the service of, of reducing the suffering as quickly as possible, basically. Um, so we need to train. 
we need to understand ourselves before we go into the training. I believe that's very, very helpful. Um, but how we do it, I think we can be much more flexible. And I use the neurocognitive model to support people to say, look, if your thing is dance, do dance. Like if dance is the thing that you're gonna do, and I'm telling you to sit on a cushion, forget the cushion, go dance. Yeah, do that, amazing, fantastic. You're in your body, you're feeling free, you're creating. But have a look at that model. And if you wanna make that mindful, and you are interested in kind of going deeper into your own landscape of mind and clearing out some of that stuff, then, you know, maybe have a session or two where you do it like this. Okay, the rest of the time, go do your freestyle, no problem. But you might choose intentionally to do a session where you do it like this. Gardening, fine, fantastic, great, go and garden, have a nice time. But you can use gardening for this learning and development process if you apply the model. So... You know, a lot of this often people kind of do think it sounds simple, um, but when they try it, they realize it's not easy. And that's because we meet the mind, we meet the conditioning. Uh, we meet a mind that has this wonderful capacity to go back to the past. It can also go forward into the future. Amazing. We can reflect and learn. We can create and imagine and we can simulate. Um, but when we try to use this default mode network, particularly in modern times, um, it's kind of clogged up often with a lot of stuff. And I use the metaphor of um, the, uh, the plug hole uh, in the bathroom when it's got too much hair in it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a grim image, so I'm sorry to put that in your mind, but I just allow that to be there because that's kind of the gist of it. Um, well, that's my experience anyway. So. <laughs> so really beginning to notice, like, when is all that hair that's just getting stuck in the plug impeding you know, the smooth running of water <laughs> from the shower down the drain. And so I'm not standing in a kind of big pile of soapy, scummy water. Um, and, you know, one is I need to kind of get a handle on some of these mental patterns and how they're being triggered automatically by mood. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with the mind being in the future. There's nothing wrong with the mind being in the past. We do encourage trying to be present for a large proportion of the time. But when we need to plan stuff, we need to use planning minds. Yeah, of course. When we want to learn, we've got to reflect on our learning and go, OK, what did I do? How did it go well? What went well? What went wonky? What can I do different? But when we're in a low mood, we have a tendency to get a little bit stuck in the past. Yeah, the brain has harnessed this reflective capacity as a way to try and soothe not feeling good. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling let down. I'm feeling disappointed, you know, usually by somebody else. And maybe my mind has got this idea that if I just work out what I did wrong, if I just work out what went wrong there, and I think it through again and again, but if I'd have said that and I should have said that and then... They would have said that, and then I shoulda, woulda, coulda, and oh, it all would have been different, and I wouldn't feel like this now. So it's a very normal harnessing of a cognitive capacity that we don't want to get rid of that has now become hijacked and in the service of managing mood. When we first do it, it really makes sense to us. I don't feel good. I've got a strategy. Brilliant. Engage it. But what happens is that that becomes automatic. In the short term, it is rewarding. Oh, that's lucky. I figured out what I, what I did wrong there, and now I just don't ever need to do that ever again, and I'll never feel sad again. Oh, fantastic. Oh, the system relaxes a little bit. We get a reward. So we do it again and again and again until it becomes automatic, and maybe we're not even aware that we're sad and upset. We just go directly into ruminative mode. And targeting rumination is a key part of what they do in the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy approach, uh, particularly for long Long-term depression, people with three or more episodes is, is the recommendation. On the other side of the scale, we have the anxious mind. And so anxiety in the body is a sense of not feeling certain, a sense of not knowing what's to come, maybe some beliefs about I, I'm, not, I'm not resourced, I'm not resilient enough um, to deal with challenges. Lots of that coming from early parenting experiences, particularly if you've had an anxious parenting experience, it's likely that you will not feel resourced. Uh, that you can manage life's challenges because you've had a model and your salience network has been tuned that everything is dangerous, that everything needs like a lot of care and hypervigilance, uh, and that you need to be on top of this all the time because otherwise you won't be safe. Yeah. So the mind that then gets harnessed for that kind of thinking is, I call this the what if monkey. Uh, the what if monkey is great because it generates tons and tons and tons of scenarios. And in fact, it tries to think through all the things that might happen uh, and how you're going to cope with them in order to soothe you 
so that you don't feel anxious. In the short term, very helpful. So, for example, me today coming to give this presentation, you know, there are always anxieties about the tech, of course. <laughs> uh, and I was allowing my mind to do a little bit of future thinking. You know, what if the computer doesn't play the video? What if my memory stick is not compatible with the thing? What if my laptop doesn't? You know, so it is helpful for me to do a little bit of future thinking problem solving. I don't want to get rid of that altogether. But if I see that I've come from home and I'm still on the tube and 20 minutes later, I'm still going, but what if it doesn't work? And what if it doesn't work? And what if it doesn't work? Then this is not helpful use of my brain. It's, I do not want to waste energy on that stuff. Yeah, I've looked at it. I've done what I can. I need to be able to let go of that. But people that are in anxiety modes, particularly generalized anxiety disorder, other kinds of anxieties, this strategy is keeping them safe. So to suddenly let go of it, is, is the challenge. And it requires some skill and some psychological holding and some safety and some resourcing um, to give people the skills and the stepping stones to be able to let go of that. When we go into the transpersonal realm, of course, it's all about being with the not knowing, isn't it? I mean, that's the main skill in these kinds of traditions. How can I step into a position of like really not knowing, really being open, really allowing whatever is the infinite possibilities that are there that's kind of a whole nother level of, of, of dealing with, with fear. But it's all the same processes in the brain as, as far as I'm concerned, current thinking. Uh, the other great capacity that we have, again, we can use it for, for kind of healthy things, we can use it in un unhealthy ways, uh, is the as if function. So this is the mind of play, of creating, of metaphor, uh, of imagery. And Sometimes we're using that skillfully to create and innovate. Other times we may not be using it skillfully. It might be an escape. Yeah, so this is the kid that likes to look out the window daydreaming because they're getting bullied. Yeah, or they've got problems at home. Maybe some domestic abuse or something going on at home, even something relatively mild like a divorce, maybe not always. Um, you know, they just want to check out. They don't want to be there. And we can do that. We can actually do that to a very, very high and far degree. I mean, in the nth case, it's complete dissociation from the body, um, which can arise from, from different kinds of trauma. It's as if I'm not here. I'm not here. I just whoosh, take my consciousness elsewhere. Something is happening to my body. It's not me. So from a neuroscience point of view, we're looking at the default mode network here. This is the networks that seem to be in operation uh, when the attentional focus on the external world dims, uh, something compelling that was there or that we chose to attend to there uh, is, is being reacted to in some way. And we have a variety of number of processes that can be used to help, but also can become problematic if they're being tuned. And the way that they get tuned is that they become just more and more automatic in our, in our brains and in our bodies. And I think that's why it's important that we work with the body as well as, as, well as mind and brain. Um, but the hippocampus uh, is a small structure, uh, number seven here, uh, an internal temporal lobe structure uh, named after the seahorse. Um, so there's the actual seahorse on the right there. And, and here's the structure of the hippocampus. So this is where we encode our memories. Uh, here's where we have our stories in a nice temporal timeline um, that helps us to hold together a coherent sense of self over time. Um, and we find that actually with meditation practices, it's not that you can grow your hippocampus, but some early work showed that those who meditate on a regular basis don't have the same age-related decline in hippocampal volume. So with normal aging, your brain basically starts shrinking. Usually it's from about the age of 60 onwards. You're using, losing about 10% of your cortex, something every 10 decades. It was a shocking statistic. <laughs> something like that, you need to be worried. Uh, and, uh, but meditation is the key. Uh, a regular meditation practice is something that will allow your hippocampus not to shrink as quickly. Um, so within the meditation research, the things that make the headlines are anything about anti-aging or anti-cognitive decline. So this was a paper from Sarah Lazar um, from Harvard. I think she was at then showing, if you meditate, you're not going to get so forgetful so quickly. Quite helpful. Uh, same as if you do kind of Tai Chi or any sort of body practice, your body will age less quickly because you're taking care of it. 
Uh, you're reducing the amount of cortisol in the system. That's thought to be one of the mechanisms. Um, there's less damage to the hippocampus by cortisol flooding through the brain when you're in these high threat state modes. And the high threat state modes include the times when you're being mean to yourself internally. Yeah. And so the hippocampus is important because it helps us to kind of store and embed memories. And it's the thing that's kind of bringing up information into our default mode network when we're trying to solve problems, uh, when we're dealing with the world, when we're interacting with the world all the time. But it's particularly interested in, in, in what happens when the system is under some sort of changing state. And it's under changing states when we're feeling stuff. So we're looking now at this kind of interaction between what we're feeling in the body, whether it's anxiety, depression, sadness, fear, uh, and then how the mind responds to it, these sort of two pieces of the puzzle, what my mind does with it and, and what's actually happening. And I share this work. I think there's been an update to this study, um, work from Finland, and I just can't, unfortunately, I can't really pronounce the name, but it's something like Neumannen. <laughs> Um, but if you Google mapping body emotions, you'll find uh, YouTube videos on this um, and a new study where they've gone a little bit more nuanced. But they asked 700 people to draw uh, on a computer where they felt an increase or a decrease in sensation related to these different emotional states. And, and I love this map. I'll read the cross for you just in case you can't see. So yellow means that there's more sensation in the body. As a mindfulness practitioner, I'm, I want more detail. I want to know the time course of that. I want to know exactly what the sensations feel like, how they unflow over time. But this wasn't a mindfulness study. It was just like, where do you feel it? So they colored in. Yellow just means more of something, and blue means less. Anger, fear, disgust, happiness, sadness, surprise, and neutral. And then the lower one, the so-called so more complex emotions, anxiety, love, depression, contempt, pride, shame, and envy. Well, any, any just kind of little popcorn comments about that? Yeah. Shame looks like Spider-Man. Shame looks like Spider-Man. What do you think that is? What, what is that bodily sensation, do you think? Flushing. Yeah, flushing of the cheeks. Yeah. So people are experiencing some of this are kind of like physiological aspects. Look at this, hands, anger, Arr, yeah, Hulk hands. Uh, sometimes when I'm working with the medical students, they like to point out, you know, happiness is when your whole body is singing, look, dancing feet, yeah, when we're really happy, when we're like really in our flow, we're activated, aren't we? And we're activated in the legs, in the body, in the feet, we were like, want to move, we want to... We want to dance even, you know. When did you last stop dancing? A great question. But they like to point out that when it's love, it's a little bit different scenario. And there's more sensations in this region here. Um, and, you know, ditto, if, if you're feeling contempt for somebody, then you definitely don't want to mate with them. Um, so, uh, so you can kind of have fun with this. But the other thing that struck me with this was the heart. You know, how the heart is really involved in everything. And, and this is where I'm more interested in moving beyond just the physiological response of the body into maybe what we might call energetic experiences. Um, but for me, you know, the distinction between some of these experiences, say, for example, love and fear, is I have a sense that my heart is making a movement. Yeah, my heart swells with pride. I get a sense that something is moving and opening. Yeah, I see the kind of client list of the people that I need to see that day. And maybe there's somebody in that list that I'm struggling with. And I have a, the doctors call this as well, the experience of the heart sinking. When you're just kind of like, oh. And it's usually around feeling incompetent. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help this person. Oh, God, you know, it's tough. Um, but being interested in the more subtle, more nuanced movements <laughs> of the body. And uh, when we can do this, when we can really engage with the body in this way, what the neuroscience is telling us is that we are able to grow regions of the brain that are responsible for encoding our embodied sense of emotion in the body. And this is the right anterior insula. Uh, the insular cortex has uh, previously risen to fame uh, as being involved in, in, in kind of gut brain responses. And, and there was a huge, quite a lot of research about irritable bowel syndrome looking at the insular cortex and the gut brain and the relationship between kind of food, nutrition, and stress, um, and mental health. Uh, and the visceroceptive cortex is kind of a little bit more lateral, but it seems that there's a part at the front of the brain that's at the front of the insula, particularly on the right-hand side, 
um, which is involved in our sensing of emotions in the body. And in a manner that, again, unfortunately, it's related to years of meditation practice, uh, correlations between the size, uh, the density of that brain region and the number of years of practice. So when people say like, oh, well, if you do meditation, then you become dispassionate, you've got dispassionate awareness, that means that you're not feeling. Really what the neuroscience is telling us is that you feel more. Yeah, you feel more because you're applying this lens of attention on a regular basis to what sensory information is in your body over the day, moment by moment, and you're just drinking it in. And with a mindful lens of attention, you're not trying to change anything. So that's why that breath practice is important, not to change the breath. What you're actually training is your capacity to hold focused attention on a moving, changing object without doing anything. That's how you can get all the data. The minute you jump in and start messing with it, you won't get all the data because you're changing things. So same with the emotions in the body. And just imagine that. Can I hold firm while I'm having a strong emotional reaction in the body, not let my mental kind of monkeys run away with getting busy processing, denying, avoiding, suppressing, analyzing, managing, but just kind of going, okay, something important is happening for me. It's my job to be really interested in this. And how much space do you need? And, and I have some exercises. I can share some resources with you online. An exercise called Going Big, which is in the book Mindfulness in Motion, which is about saying, yeah, when it comes, give it space, open. And I'm just opening with my arms to help my brain understand what it is I want it to do. But when I open with my mind, there are, there are no limits to what can be held. Um, and it's this idea holding that red of the distress inside an intentional green container of like, I know this isn't good. I know I feel uncomfortable. I'm full of fear or whatever is going on. But there is an I that's not that fear. There is a place where I can be where I'm not identified with that fear. And before mindfulness, we don't kind of get that. Actually, the fear comes, the mind comes, the, 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 the tunnel vision becomes more and more narrow. You know, it's all about me. I don't care about your ingrown toenail because I've got a paper to finish. Just take it over there. I'm not even interested. You know, I'm busy with a stressful thing. You know, it becomes all about me. And maybe anybody in the working environment m might have that experience of, of how it is to manage work demands when you're at home. Yeah, um, needing to get works, work done and, and trying to spend time with the family, for example. You know, we can get very agitated and very like, just leave me alone. I need to do it. I'm not, I can't be with you. I can't help you now. Um, and so for me, the mindfulness work and, and the training is about when noticing how the lens narrows and, and having skills to widen it. And that requires the attention system. That's why we have to train attention. Yeah, because that movement is the attentional system being either pulled in to an identified reaction or being able to say, I see there's a reaction going on there, so I'm going to go big around it. Here's my reaction still. I'm still reacting. Sorry, mindfulness doesn't initially make that immediately go away. Uh, but I can, I've got a bigger picture now, so I can see my reaction in a bigger context. Okay, that's helpful. How important is this? Do I really need to get stressed about this? Why am I putting energy into this? Is this something I can just let go of? Whose voice is that anyways that says I should or shouldn't do that thing? Whereas if I'm here around it, I don't get any of that. I'm just like, oh, I need to do something and I'm, <gasps> I'm in a reaction. So there's some work from Fab and colleagues um, based in Toronto, really, really great work showing that, that actually what happens in a, in a mindfulness training is that we have a decoupling between this medial prefrontal cortex where it's all about me and what's going to happen to me and how am I going to be safe and the insular cortex. So this is work looking at what we call diffusion tensor imaging. Uh, it's work that helps us to understand how networks are connected to each other during certain tasks. And this work for me really, really kind of resonated with what I was experiencing personally in my practice and what I saw in my clinical work, which is people are still feeling, but the thinking is decoupled and the thinking becomes more flexible and more adaptable and less rigid. Yeah, so we still feel, actually what happens is we feel more. We have more information because now we're actually looking at the body and we reduce the impact of mental habits that are kind of trying to take us away from the present moment. So not only do we manage the emotion, we gather more and more data every time we do that. So our emotional intelligence keeps on increasing. 
We have greater clarity about what is our reactive mental pattern, so we're able to just go, okay, I'm doing that thing, I'm doing that thing, I'm doing that thing, no, that's a pattern, I'm not choosing that. Or you might say, actually, no, that is a pattern, and that pattern's very helpful for me now, I need to use that. Yeah, you can always bring it back in, don't worry, those habits will still, still the seeds of them will, will always be there, probably, unless you're really practicing in an extended way. Um, so how we talk about this in the medical training is you can be a thinking, feeling doctor. Yeah, you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. Because often what happens when we work in healthcare is we prioritize the thinking and then we blunt the feeling. And this is what leads to burnout. And then when burnout comes, you can't think straight anymore and it's just feeling all over the place. <laughs> yeah, you're a bit of a mess. Um, so it's about balance in all things. And mostly we're quite left hemisphere dominant. So I'm very happy to hear that these are the right hemisphere anterior insula that we're feeding with this body information, the right hemisphere also uh, much more involved in kind of kinesthetic and movement practices. You know, I've presented today some conceptual information, which is to feed your left hemisphere a little bit. Um, but as Bruce says, um, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. Um, and so a lot of my work then really is about how do we bring this into our day-to-day -day life if we're struggling to find time to, to put our bottoms on a cushion or we're not able to make time for a regular practice of whatever is our practice uh, in the mornings or in the evenings. So much of my work now is about what I'm calling these embodiment tools for transformation. Um, they're brain-wise mindfulness tools that have been kind of designed to be used in the day-to-day -day world um, and you know, pretty much will make any situation uh, more efficient and more interesting uh, if you're able to apply the mindfulness principles. Um, but, but particularly, I think we do need these when we're undergoing transformation, and whether that's transformation in our world, in terms of the systems that we live in, which seem to be uh, undergoing rapid transformation, our models of business, uh, or whether it's in our own personal self-development work, whether that's within therapy or within transpersonal traditions. You know, what are the skills that we need to learn how to move between these spaces efficiently. It's not about I have to be in one or I have to be in the other or one is better than the other. You can have your own views on that, but the point is how do we not just get stuck here, particularly if here is where we're noticing that we're caught in habits and patterns that aren't helping us. And a good attention training will, will serve you well uh, in any situation. And you know, so some of my work is, is working with psychosis, uh, we know that there are some alterations in the default mode network and, and how it's tuned in, in psychosis. And we're also becoming increasingly aware that maybe some, some people that are undergoing a psychotic experience are, in fact, more in a transpersonal or spiritual crisis. So then this raises the question of, OK, how can the transpersonal uh, frameworks help us to understand better what people are experiencing and what does treatment look like if we come from a phenomenological perspective rather than needing to know whether the voice or the delusion or the experience is true or not. So this is some of the work I'm doing now, um, looking at, at transformation and how we can do it mindfully, whether it's within psychosis or um, a project here that I'm developing at the moment, looking at virtual reality, uh, near-death experiences. My colleague Jose is here today. Um, so trying to understand how we can use embodiment mindfulness practices based on the model to let us navigate these new spaces of mind. Uh, and just remind you that when we're having challenging conversations and things might be getting triggered, we might be reacting or, or worried about things, actually, we always have the option to set the intention of, let me approach kindly uh, and see what comes. Thank you.